can't breathe. All right. Okay, good. Oh, God, we're showing up. <laughs> yep. Okay, so uh, who's ready for some video game hacking? So, before we get into all of this, unfortunately, because we mentioned lawyers, lawyers kind of got to us first, so we just want to do some clarification and disclaimers. Uh, if you were expecting us to be like, hey, we're going to drop some major uh, zero day for Animal Crossing, even though it somehow hasn't come out yet. <laughs> That's not going to happen, uh, not because we're not like technical or anything, but more of just that if you try to uh, poke the demo gods, they will send bees at you. <laughs> so that's why we have a lot of interesting videos to uh, show you guys. Um, everything uh, that we show you here is, is public research. Um, the stuff you can easily find on the internet. Uh, we do, however, uh, caution that please don't try to do this at home. Because unless you know what you're doing, like very well, yes. Because you will break your system. You can break your system. You can uh, break your network. You can break one of your friends. You <laughs> cause demons to fly out of your game console. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just Living together. Yeah. And pigs. Yeah, forget pigs. So we know that's a just tired remark, but don't worry, we're almost near the end of this. Uh, you know, doesn't keep from trying. Uh, we won't be held responsible if you do try to do stuff. <laughs> Uh, so again, I can't repeat enough. Please, at your own risk. Please, please. And uh, this panel is also for education and entertainment purposes. We really hope you are entertained by this as uh, we had uh, making this. Uh, so, just want to note, uh, video games are the original hack. Um, when people think of video games and hacking, a lot of times we sort of see it as like, oh man, like these new hackers who are like online trying to like bust us at Fortnite and stuff. And it's like seriously because video games themselves were a hack. Uh, Ralph H. Bear, I actually was um, honored enough to meet him at a GDC years ago. Uh, he was fussing around with TV controls, figured out that like the outer limits say go go wiki it if you're too young. Um, they can control the horizontal and vertical, made a chase game, and video games were born for this multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, before him, uh, there's been many other experiments. William uh, how Higginbottom. You Thank you so much, because I suck at English. Uh, <laughs> had created a video game on oscilloscope called Tessa 2. You can find video clips online, bouncing back and forth. Beep, boop, beep. And that's from my hometown, by the way. Mm -hmm. It comes straight from Brookhaven. Long Island. Woo! <laughs> so to note that the first video games were homebrew and not commercial, eventually uh, came commercial, started off by Atari and the insane person by Nolan Bushnell, who's still active, who makes cryptocurrency games now. Don't look that up. <laughs> uh, do you want to take this part? Yeah, so um, this, is, this is just my opinion, but that was a bad idea. It, Atari commercializing video games ruined video games. It ruined the whole thing. Everything is bad about video games now. Thus, none of you are here. I'm just imagining you guys. <laughs> okay, so I think we sufficiently, what, like, bored all the lawyers in the Yeah, audience, I think so. Okay. 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 Um, all right, good. So, see yourself. Do the thing. Right. So, okay. <laughs> First things first, um, our presentations have unfortunately been rushed into production. Uh, the lawyers really made us cut like a lot of content, so we don't really have too much to work with here. But I, I mean, I, I can save us. I, I, um, I have to. Uh, sorry, what, sorry, what happened? Okay, okay. Do it. All right. Huh? So first off, um, I'm gonna enter a cheat code real quick. All right. So now we're in. Uh, uh, what? I gotta pull down the dev console and wait for this to load. Um, <laughs> Don't try this at home. Okay, and we're connected. I can now just put in the command, enable cheats, and load our actual presentation. So, without further ado, this is Cheat to Win Video Games from a Hacker's Perspective. So, I'm Cyrus Hill, um, this is N Commander over here, this is Side Pocket, and this is our special guest, uh, Squirtle. He was a late addition. Yeah, kind of like, showed up out of nowhere, honestly. So, um... I came from the wild grass, what do you want? Yeah, I, I, I basically do a lot of graphic design stuff, hacking on the side, um, Side Pocket here is... Uh, don't forget your two big things, you're part of Switch Root, you got featured on uh, Linus Tech Tips. Okay, yeah, yeah, um... Yeah, Switch Root was a project that I started to port an Linux to the Nintendo Switch. Android was eventually ported as a result of that, and we maintain and 
keep the community strong for that. Plus, it was featured out. on Linus Tech Tips and yeah, pretty Woo! exciting. Also, if you see him at Night Fest, say hi. He's one of the major people. Yeah, I, I do a lot of the museum there, so I'm always there every year. Okay, and that so, was closed up. So I'm in Commander. Um, I do a lot of things, but my biggest contribution to video games was I worked at Beam, later Mixer, and devised and designed the FTL streaming protocol for um, to get rid of that annoying lag when we play interactive video games. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's getting a point from you uh, In my free time, I work on network security and information security, and I really enjoy making certain developers just cry when I just show everything's broken. So, <laughs> also, lots and lots of Minecraft. Well, yes. Well, there's a reason why I'm listed as Resident Evilus. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, oh, let's yeah. go back. Yep, there it is. No, uh, Resident Evil. Yep. There we go. So, uh, <laughs> just real quick, uh, the, in the hacker world, I'm usually referred to as side pocket. I don't know if anyone bothers to remember, but back in the Cretaceous period, I started a uh, awesome uh, Nintendo group in New York City called the Street Pass in New York City. Uh, it was a really fun time. I got to meet Reggie and do a lot of cool promotional stuff with Nintendo. And I decided, well, Switch is coming out. I'm getting tired. I know. I should start a hacking group with my roommate. And that's how DEF CON 201 was born. There's also Squirt, but we're not going to talk about it. We'll give them it up about like 30 seconds. Go. One. Uh, God damn it. I don't like this. Pressure. Uh, no, I'm Squirtle. I am. I'm actually. I uh, used to be a professional Pokemon player back in the days of Oras. If anyone remembers Oras, back a while ago. Um, my major contribution is mainly I just talk about Pokemon and they listen to me babble for three hours. <laughs> That's highly accurate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, we are Death Hunt Two Hundred One. Uh, yep. So without further ado, um, here's a basic introduction of who we actually. Push start. I'm trying and enter. enter. There we go. Guys, did you take my red version without asking again? Hey, um, you weren't using it. Yeah. So yes, we did uh, <laughs> have a Pokemon Red game. So Def Con 201 real quick, we, um, we're a uh, computer hobbyist and hacker group that uh, meets in this uh, terrible nexus of the universe called New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> we're located in Jersey City, we meet Dirt Drive every month, you can uh, encounter us at, uh, that is the most derpiest looking Corridor. <laughs> <laughs> when I first saw it, I thought it was a Psyduck. <laughs> no, that, that's later. That, that's how I look when I'm like doing website updates at 3am in the morning. Um, but no, uh, we meet through Friday every month. We, we do uh, coding tutorials. We uh, teach people how to pick locks. We do hardware uh, hacking examples and have a good time at this great place called Subculture, which has uh, Raspberry Pi video game machines and really awesome sandwiches. Uh, you can go to defcon201.org and uh, check us out there. Uh, we, if you happen to break through New Jersey, we really hope to see you guys. And, uh, and how long is this demo? Uh, it should have already been done. Go, <laughs> there we go. Yay. Because I want to get to actual hacks. Come on, we're here for the hacks. Okay, fine. So let me just drop this. And drop it's hot. Back to uh, hacking. So who is DEF CON 201 anyway? We're hackers. Like he already mentioned, we're from Jersey. I literally have a shirt that says hacker on it. Yeah. So this is us. Um, wait, wrong picture. Sorry. This is us. We did not steal a Bitcoin ATM. We Although I really wanted it for Christmas. You can't have it. I wanted it though. The police said no. Well, I want probation. <laughs> wait, wait, so, wait. We're, we're in Focus, Jersey guys. City. Focus. We're in Jersey City. We meet every third Friday of the month at a sandwich shop called Subculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, we celebrate hacking, we educate people, and uh, just discuss things that are going on. And uh, we won't hack your Facebook. We won't, we're, we're not those kind of people. I love the one disappointment line. We won't that. hack your girlfriend's Facebook, your boyfriend's Facebook, your exes, etc., etc. That's illegal, that's cybercrime. 
not all hackers do cybercrime. In fact, maybe a very tiny amount of them do. And to us, if you're doing cybercrime, we can't really call you a hacker. Uh, I you're will say this though, we will be getting to those in a moment later on. Yeah. This so now on to some games. So first off, Nintendo. Woo. We uh, we're pretty much just starting at the end here. So the NES was Nintendo's first console. It had DRM, surprisingly. It was a chip, a lockout chip, in both the console and in the cartridge called the NES CIC. It pretty much locked the games to the cartridges and to the console and made sure that you couldn't, you know, reproduce it. So how is it broken? Lawyers. And glitching, mostly lawyers. <laughs> so a company called Tengen, which produced third-party unauthorized Nintendo software, they had pretty much broken into Nat Nintendo's patent portfolio by doing what anyone do would do when searching for patents. Searching for patents. They found that the entire 10NES, also called the CIC chip, was documented in full on their patent portfolio, and sure enough, they were able to turn it off. Now, other bootleg producers also use a high voltage pulse to disable the hardware. We find that kind of dirty. This is a more clean, but not so clean, reverse engineering. Um, much later on, it was clean room reverse engineered using the actual chip by microanalyzing the structures on the microchip. So the SNES and the N64 also had a CIC chip, but they were very much different in that they changed their code and uh, completely changed the architecture as of the N64 so that multiple CIC chips existed and they couldn't cooperate with each other and games could check the CIC periodically and break down if they got a false review. So, okay. Uh, Sega, on the other hand, played smart. They, they skipped right to the lawyers. So, rather than doing anything technical, they just put a chip in the boot sector of the Sega Genesis, right where the uh, CP would jump into where the cartridge is supposed to go. They called it the TMSS, or Trademark Security System. This produced a screen that said, produced by or under license, and it required you to put the string SEGA in your cartridge. Now, this wasn't security by any stretch of the imagination. This was law they were exploiting. And I would say it was until it wasn't, because they wanted to sue people who tried copying that SEGA string, and they did. Accolade Inc. was the first lawsuit of this type, and sure enough, Accolade wins. So. The courts had found the Accolade's use of the trademark string to make the game work was perfectly fine. It was, they, they weren't being locked out from doing that, and there was nothing in the law that said they couldn't. Now, the Sega, on the other hand, was drop-kicked by the courts, basically. They couldn't use trademark as a copyright enforcement exercise, and that was the fact. As insult to injury, this is still legal law in the United States because of this, and it also showed that abusing trademark cannot be used as a copyright protection scheme. This went to the Supreme Court. Yes. So, this, among other things, led to the infamous Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Are any of you guys who wrote that here? <laughs> yeah, I've been on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah, it, it brought us uh, draconian policies and uh, pretty much made it impossible for anyone to hack game consoles legally until some challenges were brought to that. Here comes and another challenge. Homebrew games were uh, pretty much made legal in other ways. And also, another thing to note was uh, that pre preservation of games was later deemed to be important. And most of these laws were in the way of that, so the Library of Congress made exceptions to those rules. So, modern solutions led to modern hacks. Nintendo just, rather than doing anything else special, once the Wii started to hit and the DS was on, they began using more advanced cryptography, such as RSA and AES blocked ciphers. Um, 
Microsoft and Sony as well, they produce their own uh, protections. And with that, we produced our own brakes in the form of various methods. We'll get into one of them shortly. So suddenly there was security. Everyone was happy. There was no hacking. There was no copying. Everything was, there, there was no piracy. That's what they wanted you to believe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so hackers enjoy challenges. And this was a challenge. Not just a challenge, a challenge on a computer that we wanted to get into. So the first entry points we had looked into were save data. We could modify it and we could change it. So the... Yeah, this, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is where I took over. <laughs> He's been excited to do this all week. <laughs> yes. So um, when we came to hacking, this specifically applied to the Nintendo Wii. So one of the first things we did uh, as the Wii is really notable on how its system security went down in flames. It was specifically <laughs> bypassed with a pair of tweezers. Um, <laughs> My Adventures Gamer has a really awesome video on that. I just want to quickly clarify that when we say we, we mean like the hacker community, and I think particularly what Fail Overflow worked on this. Yeah, Fail Overflow were the original developers of the Homebrew Channel and other exploits for the Wii. Mm -hmm. Yes, so they, they have all the credit, they have amazing stuff on hackwee.com, but the long and short of it is, by applying a pair of tweezers to when you insert a GameCube game into the Wii, you are able to download all the interesting security keys that Nintendo didn't want you to know, including the one for the save game encryption key. So with this, we can now decrypt and edit save games. In and of itself, interesting, but then we can take it a step further. Now, most of us who had a Wii probably remember one of the early launch titles, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, one of the more Ooh. beloved Legend of Zelda games. Linda's my baby. Now, as it turns out, if you took a modified Twilight Princess save game and did horrible, horrible things to the horse's name, it would completely break the Wii system security and let you install the homebrew channel. And this save affair lasted for three years until Nintendo learned an important lesson. Being able to fix your console is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, slides, yeah. the most exercise we've gotten all day. <laughs> so yeah, the Twilight hack is probably the most famous example of this type of break on the game system. And it's not the first. Mechasol had uh, been the original break into the original Xbox that was publicly released. It used a save file for, obviously, Megasol, and the save file was curiously named One Linux. I wonder why. So There's also another game that did it, but we can show that later. Yeah. <laughs> Linux on game consoles was another one of these hack challenges, and uh, pretty much every console since the original um, Dreamcast had had a port of Linux to it. Just to note uh, for everyone who's kind of curious out there, uh, Linux is a type of uh, operating system that you can get for your computer that is mostly, if not all, free and open source software, meaning that anyone can share it and use it, unlike uh, um, Windows and uh, Mac OS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being that it's open source, anyone can modify it, and they did. They just modified the code to make it run on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, chances are anyone who has an Android phone is running Linux right now, and anyone who has a router in their house or any IoT devices or whatever, they're probably running Linux, probably a very old and outdated version of Linux. So that once we have that busted games. wide open, uh, what, what, what should we put on it? So what about Humber? So early, early I homebrew. I that started me on. Yeah, I like <laughs> Early homebrew was very rudimentary. And uh, piracy devices, which obviously would have developed for the intent of copying games, had often been sold under the radar as being homebrew SDKs, and this was often the case up until the N64, I want to say, because after the N64, homebrew development got a lot more uh, professional, I want to say. Uh, things like DevKit Pro and uh, toolkits, which you could download on your computer and run on your own console without any special hardware, became very popular. This is an SNES copier. It's a, it's a floppy disk that just snaps onto the top of the Super Nintendo. So we we'll this. <laughs> yeah. And that would allow you to use piracy, but it would also allow you to develop homebrew. So there was kind of a double-edged sword with that. Generally, Nintendo didn't like this. So this is pretty much where it started. Um, 
At least on the console side. I think this slide was put in out of order. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. So many successful game series had started off as homebrew on game consoles. So, for instance, uh, do you know of anything? Oh yeah, that's easy. Um, the Gina Sisters. Oh yeah, the, the Great Gina Sisters. <laughs> yeah, that, that started off as a. It's like a Super Mario Brothers game uh, that eventually became its own thing. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was created on the Amiga originally, and a lot of bedroom coders had home computers and made games on their own home computers, and people wanted to bring that to the game consoles, and well, they did. So. Uh, this is the part where we move on. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to cover a different topic here, so do you want to bring up the video list? Yeah. Awesome. All right, so that we covered a lot with uh, Nintendo here. Um, I cut, we kind of want to touch a bit on like what Sony is doing, and uh, uh, you've had more experience in this. Yeah. Yeah. You can talk here if you want. Yeah, okay. So um, it may be hard to believe, but there was a time where Sony was really friendly to the homebrew and independent developer company. And this lasted up until about 10 years ago. Um, maybe just due to their famous falling out with Nintendo, which is a talking of it itself. Um, but anyway, when um, the PlayStation first came out, about a year after its release, there was a special version of it called the Net Neurosi, which was an all-black um, PS1 that would connect to a Microsoft DOS compatible computer, just to give you an idea of the era. And what this version of the PlayStation 1 would do is it would let you write games on your computer, download them to your PlayStation, and then be able to execute them. And then Sony had this entire support infrastructure where you could communicate with other developers, upload code, and communicate them. And a lot of people in the industry got their start with that. And a few games from the next year, yeah, no, it's kind of like it's Steam Early Access, but it actually had good products. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Oh, I'll say it. <laughs> okay. okay, anyway, uh, so from that starting point, because the intent of the project was to bring the PlayStation where uh, home computers were, that you could program yourself, they decided, let's go a step further. Uh, uh, basically, like if, if you put some context, uh, Nintendo, because they were trying to resuscitate the market and they were the big dogs at the time, were extremely controlling and that's why it's, uh, Sega's and Sony's policies were more towards that, oh, are they trying to restrict developer tools? Let's just give them out and things like that. So when they did the Net Neurosi across the world, I see at the back issues of uh, EGM, I think it's EGM2, and be like, I want one of those. So when they were like, okay, this works for PlayStation, let's take this a step further, and they uh, basically introduced Linux for PlayStation 2. And the way this works is that you got a kit, and it came with two disks, uh, one that boots Linux and one that installs Linux. And so you put the disk in. You also needed the uh, Ethernet adapter, uh, HED Ethernet adapter, a uh, working hard drive, and a memory card. So once you got that all in, you would put the disk in, and uh, it would change through, and then Linux would start loading and doing its thing. And then the next thing you know, uh, you actually have your own operating system, and you can go on web browse and stuff like that. Uh, anything you would do on a computer, graphic artistry, games, you could do that. You could also even program your own games. They use their own programming language for that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Roughly speaking, the PlayStation 2 for Linux was about the same power as Sony's official development kit, the PS2 yes. tool, albeit with no support. Um, and all you needed was an off-the-shelf PlayStation 2 and the Linux kit, which was about hundred and... $50, I think? Right, yes. And because of that type of price, it was a weird thing that Sergio was going to talk about that actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, before, uh, before uh, September 11, 2001, Saddam Hussein was really a bogeyman in pretty much everyone's American lives. And he went and uh, bought a shipment of thousands of PlayStation 2 systems with the Linux development kit. And um, back then, the PS2 was a very powerful system compared to a lot of home computers, along with the Emotion Engine, the vector processors built into it, the graphic synthesizer, and the way it could feed data across a 128-bit bus. It was incredible. 
and very good for things like missile computers and simulating nuclear fallout. And, and needless to say, the army was concerned, and the media got even more concerned. So just imagine that, like, if, if you were in like a battalion in the early Second Iraq War and a missile came towards you, that might have actually been guided by a PlayStation 2 game console. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and it was low power too, so it was great. <laughs> and so. Uh, well, great in terms of the device works, not for the results of it. <laughs> well, um, yeah, application wise. Sorry, we end up getting into these things. Uh, so, <laughs> unfortunately, because of that, somebody went, okay, so that experiment worked. Maybe the Saddam thing, not so much, but, you know, this would work. Let's take another further. And so, if you got an early PlayStation 3, it actually came with a function called Other OS, which would allow you, without any buying that, remember all that kit in the uh, PlayStation 2 Lakes hardware? This was just right off the system itself. So, as he puts the Tux guy on, you just burned a copy of Linux onto a disk, stuck it in there, uh, run up uh, other OS, and we just start installing Linux. And you can just have a desktop computer. The, one of the first companies that did this, they partnered with, was Yellow Dog. Yep. Which made Yellow Dog Linux. Yeah, and Sony even went as far as partnering with the largest Linux vendor at the time, uh, Canonical for Ubuntu. They were very determined to support this product. They also were supporting with IBM because this had the cell microprocessor, and they, this was big. This was on the box of the Fed. This is basically probably why they unfortunately engineered the PlayStation 3 to be a server blade that ends up playing games. Yes, <laughs> that, that is, in, and a uh, Blu-ray did uh, Yes. So uh, you're probably wondering, wow, this all this stuff is amazing. Like, why why can't I get a refurbished PlayStation 3 and run this for? Why doesn't PlayStation 4 just uh, run Linux? Spoiler: It can, just not officially. Um, yeah. We will get to that in a bit. But there's a reason why we don't have that anymore, and it's from a guy named Geo Hot. Does anyone remember this story out in the audience? Raise a hand. Ooh. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, especially because there was a swear word in it, um, we were going to show you a hilarious video of this guy who now runs a multi-billion, uh, multi-million dollar AI company, uh, rapping about being sued by Sony when he was a teenager. But we figured we already subjected you to one horrible rap video. We don't want to do another. <laughs> So uh, you can go look it up on YouTube, uh, YouTube though, it's hilarious. So Geo Hoax, uh, funny enough, he actually was raised in Hackensack, New Jersey. New Jersey, woo! You're starting to notice a pattern here of crazy people and computers in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what made him interesting is that like, he did a lot of hacking when he was really young. I, if I remember correctly, at 17, he, jail, he did the first ever real jailbroken iPhone. And at 17. sold for uh, like a hundred thousand or a million bucks, I can't remember. Yeah, he got reward for that. It's the first what we call a bug bounty where you find issues and get rewarded for it by the company. So he decided, oh, I'm a wizard genius. I should jump over. What's it? PS3 I want in my house. Let's try that. So he figured out a major vulnerability. Do you have any? Problems? Yeah, I can describe it. Yeah. So one disadvantage to other OS on the PlayStation 3 was it locked out some of the 3D effects and parts of the security model. Uh, so yeah, it would, you couldn't access the whole system. When you it disabled the graphics card, and the hypervisor was still running, and kept you from using two of the seven available SDs. Right. The, the reason for this is so that people would still would have reason to buy Sony's dev kits and do licensing and so forth. Um, Geohots managed to break this, and Sony um, decided and removed the other OS feature from the up-and-coming PlayStation 3 Slim, and then pushed a software update to remove it from the original PS3. This made people angry. <laughs> and if there's one group of people you do not want to piss off, it is the hacker community. <laughs> now, up to the, the, there's a more side story. Up to this point, the PlayStation 3 had been on the market for about four to five years. Its copy connection had not been broken. This is not true of the 360 or the Wii, which went down in flames within six months. <laughs> this is about to change. <laughs> yeah, so the PS3, they, even after Geohots had hacked the uh, hypervisor running other OS, it was still not really easy to copy games, run pirated material, or just run your own homebrew within the game OS. You still had to run through other OS. It was a bit contrived. So remember that group that we talked about earlier with Twilight Princess Fail Overflow? Yeah, so Fail Overflow comes back into the picture and uh, begins developing vulnerabilities and exploits to uh, uh, get into the PS3. Start ripping but the system to shreds. They don't publish their things because they didn't want to enable piracy. They mm -hmm. thought that it was a noble motive to not do so. And people were still upset, and people got upset at Fail Overflow for doing the right thing. And so, Geohotz basically said, F it, we'll do it live. 
Yeah. And so, we install the root codes for it. <laughs> yeah, GeoHots published the codes, the, the um, keys to the uh, 3.4 or 3.1 something hyperparameter. Uh, no, uh, Metaloader was what you pop. Oh, Metaloader. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, Metaloader, basically it's the first, uh, the second bootloader? Second. First. Really? Yeah. I'll yeah. start the system, yeah. So that, the key that that used was now out in the open, but nobody could really use it at home because you needed to attach hardware to the NAND chip and do various weird things. And Well, some Chinese hackers wanted piracy to happen, and a, um, a feature of the PS3, <laughs> a feature of the PS3, which was actually a good idea at the time, was that if you had a PS3 that had software damage, it could be sent back to Sony for repair, and they had what was called a jig to reset to factory defaults and basically unlock the console to the point that it was at the factory for mm -hmm. reverting it back to Sony. Basically, everything is open during the factory, and then they lock it up and shift it to consumers. This brought it back to that point, which means, hey, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, so that jig had gotten leaked and immediately had been reverse engineered by some weird Chinese hackers. I don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually a solution was sold as the PS jailbreak. Mm -hmm. And some of you might remember when this PS jailbreak got out and how quickly it sold out and then people were scalping the prices for 20, 30 times what it was originally, you'd see them going for thousands of dollars. Long, long story short, basically, Sony had a conniption and started to sue, uh, uh, businesses for time, uh, started to uh, basically did giant lawsuits for GeoHotes and fail the flow, and they eventually settled out of court, uh, where basically GeoHotes got to live the hacker movie uh, dream of not being able to work on Sony products in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think they actually sued Failover Flow, did they? No, they didn't sue, it was just GeoHogs. It was just GeoHogs, yeah. yeah. yeah but no, they wrote them into there is one final bit of the story that has to be Go ahead. Okay. When the PSG was hacked, they discovered that Sony had implemented the internals so poorly that the developer-only PSN net leaked and every game was hackable. There's, this is the reason why for about three to four months, P, uh, PlayStation Online games went poof, mm -hmm. and we all got complimentary games for when Sony finally brought the service back. And they had the three people bow and everything, yep. Yeah. Yes, so the long story short is, don't piss off the hacker community, it won't end well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, to, before we finish up this section, again, like I said, it was this amazing history with uh, PlayStation uh, having Linux support, really sucks that doesn't happen today. Oh wait, you can't actually do that because a bunch of groups playing. Don't play the video yet. Uh, Sorry. That's fine. Fail over, uh, groups like Fail Overflow have managed to basically figure out the PS4 and it's actually quite simple. Who has been on like a, a Reddit or God forbid NeoGAF and you uh, and you heard the phrase, oh, like modern systems like the upcoming PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, that they're basically souped up mid-range PCs. Turns out they actually are. Uh, uh, I'll let him go ahead, but basically, for example, if you look at the uh, the kernel, the poor operating system for PlayStation 4, it's literally uh, it was a version 9 of uh, FreeBSD, and there's just a couple of functions added just to make it a PlayStation 4, and that's it. So this exploit starts off with WebKit, which is in pretty much everything. It's a very basic web browser engine, and everything implements it. It goes from WebKit to a kernel exploit to running Linux. Uh -huh. And that's why you can do things like this, if you can play it. Um, is he going to yep. play it? Yeah, he's going to play it. So he's actually, this is a tap, he's running the operating system of like, oh, what can I do here? And how about playing your entire Steam library off of your PlayStation 4? Yeah, Mark N42 <laughs> is amazing. Go follow him on Twitter, by the way. So yeah, uh, yeah, basically you can just run Steam on the PS4 because it's running the same architecture as a modern PC. It's x86-64, mm -hmm. and it has an AMD graphics chip in it, and mm -hmm. all the drivers are all That's why there. we can't wait for the next systems to come out, because we've already seen with the Nintendo Switch, it's basically a tablet, you can make it into a tablet, and I can't mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but uh, obviously we probably let Something out. Wasn't there something after my uh, second one? Oh yeah, that our favorite company that we like, Microsoft. Oh yeah. So Microsoft, starting out with the Xbox, I briefly mentioned that there were safe game hacks and exploits for that. That was the easy way, and um, the original research was a lot more difficult. Uh, a person named Andrew Huang, Bunny, had done some absolutely bat crazy. Stuff. 
with the original Xbox. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have a, a video of something we can put on there. Because um, thanks to his exploits, you can uh, put that in the Xbox. There it is. There it is. So just activate the file and so copy it audio onto audio Xbox hard reason. disk. I don't know. Uh, so let's turn down the uh, yeah. video yeah. audio. Yeah. So basically you load through a safe file, you probably saw there's something called the Debian logo there, and it goes into this uh, program, which basically makes it into a kind of PC. Yeah, so this is the Evolution X dashboard. It was a reverse engineered, uh, reassembled, uh, bootloader program for running Xbox Homebrew and games. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, rather insane stuff they were doing with the yeah. Xbox. And then, the before we got in the juicy section, I just want to mention one other thing about Xbox. This is probably more pertinent to today. Uh, who remembers the uh, crazy uh, camera that was known as Xbox Connect? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. They have them down there for the Dan Central off. Um, so, a lot of people were like, oh, it's like the Wii, we can track stuff with like uh, AI sculpture and stuff, and we're just thinking, AI, always on camera, always on microphone, this is Google, this is their, like, and the AI, we know that it's not going to be built internally, so there has to be other companies they're bringing in, so we, uh, myself, would print out flyers and send them out to people like, hey, warning, your Xbox camera is always on, we don't know who has control, it could be spying on you, and Microsoft had to repeatedly go to the press, letting people know it doesn't spy on them, until about, what was it, like, half, like uh, six or eight months ago, where ex-employees from third-party companies were like, we heard so many uh, husband and wife fights and people playing naked in front of their TV and stuff like that through the Xbox Connect and just never reported on, but we would just eat chips and watch, so... Yeah. Uh, so basically, the things that Alexa and Ring Doorbells were doing. And, and real quick, just as a warning, there's kind of a sequel to that that Sony might do. There's actually a patent going around uh, where they have sort of a, a, a Siri type AI, apparently, that's going to might have a PlayStation 5 where. Uh, if you like have a hard time facing a boss, it will then be like clip like clippy from Microsoft. Hey, we noticed you're having trouble time with the boss. Do you want to do this technique or this technique? Except part of its database is, hey, you're having trouble with this boss. You know there's a microtransaction that's on the store that will allow you to bypass that. So just when we thought something like connect or whatever would be bad, just please hope that they don't do that. Yeah, so Despite the uh, laws on the books that say that companies need to be upfront with you about your privacy with them, your data on their servers, your data being shared from their servers, it's still very important that you are aware of what's going on and keep in touch with, you know, the underlying tone of these things. Yeah, you need to know, like, what your rights are, what you can do if your phone gets hacked or you feel mm. compromised. Or, this can happen to anybody. So, first off, I'm just going to say that you agreed to have all that happening. It's in the privacy policy, it's in the terms of service. That 61-page sleeping pill that you just scroll through, hit I agree, and go on the next page, next, mm -hmm. next, next. Yeah, that, you just pretty much told them that you implicitly want them to do this to you. So what would you so, be able to do about that? One, one of the things uh, you can do to prevent this from happening to you is just be aware that it's happening. And if you don't like it, tell them to... Yeah, that's exactly why uh, this is actually going to be part of a raffle we'll do at the end or like afterwards we want to do a shout out to the uh, EFF. They're called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They are a group of... <laughs> Uh, look out for your own digital and privacy rights. They fight a lot of battles for everyone, and uh, you can check out and go some laws. Uh, there's also a really great website, by the way, because uh, I think I should bring this up now, called uh, privacytools.io. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? The pro got you over there? Oh, yeah. So, quick question before we move on, because we're going to get to some really juicy stuff in a minute. Um, how many people actually read the FAQ for the PAX website? I knew there was going to be like... I'm saying like... Not even so, so if you go on there, they ask, hey, could you use public Wi-Fi? And it's like, you could, but everyone's going to be on it. Now, uh, don't be alarmed. We brought this really cute device. It's called Tonagachi. You have it upside down. It's like yeah. a little, little Tonagachi. It's happy we named it Zelda. Uh, lower it Everyone watched it. It seems nice. Uh, it's connected to a Raspberry Pi Zero. It's a type of microcontroller. And what it actually does is it goes and says, hey, 
your phone does not have a VPN or something protecting it. I'm going to attempt to talk to it. Now, we can't see like passwords and emails and stuff, but if it does what's called a handshake where it connects, we're basically kind of logging those to the cons. We want to see how many people actually are securing their phones. And on sorry about the camera's back. Yep, and, just, and we're going to do a website. You look so cyberpunk in this. We're going to actually bring it up in a moment. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, we, uh, we're going to be experimenting with that throughout the con. So if you don't want to be on the Ponegachi, you go to privacytools.io, click Android or iOS, and it gives you a bunch of lists of free stuff that you can use to easily protect yourself. Rather famously, DEF CON does this every year with their, um, their wall of sheep and the very interesting things that people look on conference Wi-Fi that I cannot say in a PG talk. Okay, so let's go through this. So, quick question. Who here loves DRM? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Good, I was waiting for like one exec to be like, me, this is my moment. Now, uh, now, now, our lawyers said that we have to we, we can't not like DRM because it's important and necessary yeah. for the businesses to make their money. No. I mean, so, getting a uh, uh, thing of uh, DRM uh, here, uh, uh, and Commander is going to talk a bit about uh, one of the first types of DRM, or modern DRM, which is secure ROM. Do we really have to? Just, just say okay. two sentences. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Secure ROM, how to ruin your computer in free clutch or less. Um, this was back in the days when we used to install games from CDs, and the concept was that Secure ROM was copy protection for your CD-ROM drive. It did this by doing horrible, horrible things to Windows, like, I don't know, hacking the kernel, installing a driver, um, bricking your CD-ROM drive, and requiring limited activations. This rather famous CD brought four from five to one stars on Amazon, if you remember this. So after that happened, I think you just made a guy's day or made his nightmare. Uh, there's probably a DRM that you're more familiar with. It's called, uh, was it Dunevo? Dunovo? Dunovo. Uh, I call it Dudu. Um, <laughs> if you've ever been on Steam, this DRM gets kind of compiled on, and uh, it's really terrible. It now gets cracked really fast, but this is one of the cracking groups that actually did this on the side. But the note is that it also makes your game terrible. So note the no Dunovo one, and now the one with Dunovo, the file size change. That's what you're adding on to the game. It also will make it run slower or more terrible. If you have nothing to compare it to, you wouldn't know about it. And actually, this cracking team, they cracked this game because they wanted to see if they could strip the DRM out of it because there was rumors, particularly from the Ubisoft side, that it actually does impact performance. And it turns out it does, despite what their press release says. So you can see how long the load times are and stuff without that. Uh, again, we're not going to go into details of how it's cracked uh, because that uh, would be illegal. But I can bring up something that's actually, believe it or not, worse than this, and that is called the uh, Windows uh, Universal Windows Platform. This is Microsoft's proprietary uh, thing. It's not really used in Windows anymore. Actually, can you pause it here? Okay. But uh, but uh, it, any Microsoft first party thing, particularly get Xbox, is on this platform. Not only does it do all the encryption stuff that DeNovo does, try not to. Uh, hack it or, or rip it, and it takes up a lot of space, a ridiculous amount of space. It also checks with Microsoft servers, is that always online DRM they try to pitch for the Xbox One, uh, to make sure everything's connected. This was really difficult to try to figure out and crack, kind of the first ones, you can start playing the video, was uh, they would use a thing called PowerShell, which is like a terminal thing in Windows, to basically say, hey, it's okay, and then check the server, and then you can get things like Forza Horizon 4 running. If you remember Windows Live, uh Games, yeah, games for Windows Live. That was basically version one mm -hmm. of all this stuff. Version two added Metro from Windows 8. Yep. And, then, and then to kind of cap it off before we go into a really fun topic, this is the meat and potatoes of this talk. Uh, does anyone remember the Lizard Squad incident? I really hope you weren't affected by that. Lizard Squad is a group of, there's a term we use in hackers called skids. These are people, they might know some technical skill, uh, they might have high-powered hacker tools, but a lot of them are actually real-life kids who just, hey, it's like, hi, my dad's gun, I'm gonna use it on everything, and that's how they use software. And so Lizard Squad was a group of literal teenagers around the world, and they were using what's called DDoSing, which is sending fake data to make sure games can connect online, so they kicked Destiny offline, World of Warcraft for a bit, then decided, hey, uh, we want to go for the big leagues, and they decided on Christmas, I can't remember which year it was, but on Christmas a couple years ago, they just knocked PSN and Xbox uh, live online for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Didn't go down until a hacker who's also a gamer, Kim.com, who owns Mega.com, which is like a 
um, place to send download videos and stuff, offered them free membership, and then they stopped. So then they went, hey, we are now elite hacksaws. We are in the media. I know what we should do. We should try attacking the Tor network. The Tor network is a, a really awesome privacy thing that's made by the Tor project, it's supported by the EFF, that makes your that when properly done, makes a lot of your stuff really anonymous, really hard to break. They tried to hack it and they failed. And I think the statute of limitations might be up on this, but I will say that I can't confirm or deny that I saw a lot of gamers who were really affected by this at Christmas Day and also was really mad that they attempted to try to do this. And I may or may not have worked with a group of hackers that realized, hey, they actually do a terrible job of hiding their tracks. And those hackers might have then figured out what, where they are, who they are, and then was like, hey, Interpol, do you want to press it? Here you go, and that was the end of them. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> so I think if they had something to say here, they would say, you're welcome. But let's get to something really cool. So uh, if you look as, 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 as uh, Super Mario Brothers 3 here. Uh, yeah. So who has checked out the speed running thing downstairs? I love this type of stuff. So there's a lot of crazy things you could do with games. That, that makes speedrunning really fun. So I think this is this World 7.1, so we're just gonna watch this play through. So he goes in, moves some enemies, does things the shell. What the, whoa, what the, what is that? Did Mario just glitch the Matrix? What's going, oh, we're at the end of the game. <laughs> yep. This so, is, yeah, you want this, this, yeah, uh, over. The, this is what's called an arbitrary code execution exploit. And um, basically what they did was corrupted the game state so much using only the inputs from the controller to absolutely wreak havoc and destroy the game by rewriting its code from within the game engine. There's no external tools for this, it's all done in the game. Basically, and you can play the Super Mario Bros. World video here. Uh, hopefully there's no audio. As you can see on the left, there's different X and Y values for the different sprites, that's a different movement. So what you do is you, you go in certain places, move certain items, he's gonna get Yoshi in Super Mario Bros. World. And as you can see here, he's like setting up all the enemies in different spots, and all those numbers and letters are different code that is being written in real time. Now, once you have the code written, you're like, and you'll notice actually something here, the screen shift over, that means, uh oh, it's starting to break. Uh, when you start covering how you do that, well, you use an exploit, and this exploit is, they were, the game was never told what happens if you eat a charging chuck. Like, it's because it's impossible to do. But if you drop an item while a charging chuck jumps at you, it will accidentally eat both of them. And then the game's like, this is not part of the script. What do we do here? It didn't tell us, uh, well, there's a bunch of code here written on this side, maybe that, and uh, congratulations, you have beaten the game 100%. Woo, great job. Hey. So yeah, arbitrary code execution is powerful. And it's one of the ways that hackers get into computer systems and break things too. It's not just limited to video games. Yep, so now I'll load up Doom real quick because I love this part. So you're probably thinking, oh, Super Mario Brothers World, that's like, you know, new. It's not just that old game. It's not a new game, but what? Okay. So this is Doom 2006, uh, 2016. And in the same way, if you've ever seen Super Mario where they can like jump through walls, because of the way the level structure is in Doom 2 2016, you can actually like push yourself through walls and then just jump through the levels and pass each parts of it. If I remember correctly, one of the workouts I heard is that you can finish this game in 20 minutes now in terms of speed running. So with that being said, uh, and we should do this part, one last video. Now that you know that you can clip through stuff, exploits and code injection, I want to show you the funniest, most fun uh, video uh, Castlevania. Oh yeah. Uh, one that I've ever seen, it'll take a minute, but it's worth it, which is the speed run where they did Castlevania Symphony of the Night in five minutes. Oh, it's not gonna be the full five minutes thing. So yeah, first of all, things down. you enter a certain uh, name, that will come important later. So the thing is, in order to do the arbitrary code injection, you need to get to the castle. So first we need to get there. This is called moonwalking, where players realize that backdashing and cancel out actually makes you move faster now. He's gonna jump into this and he quickly, he quickly, and then he what is it, what, 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 whoa, what was that? <laughs> well, it turned out that when you uh, hit an enemy backwards and you equipped and equipped items, it was never told what to do, so the physics engine just says, F it, do it live, and we'll do a knockback that will send you all the way across the level, and you're gonna see that again. So he goes over, he's gonna back dash into this, he's gonna go unbump and just do that, and he's holy, <laughs> Thank you for flying, Hacker Airlines. <laughs> now, he's getting to his first save room because he's in the castle. Now, he's going to save, he's going to do a bridge where he's going to restart the game at, I think it's like 2.5 seconds. 
And see that name there? That's a dev name. Now he's in the development mode. So all this, the spaces here that were locked for items are now open. So he's going to rearrange some items. We're just going to write a bunch of arbitrary code. It's a lot of items. He's just going to go through this. and Just moving in the items. <laughs> and then after it moves some items, he's going to move the last one in place. Writing code with items. And uh, let's see, move that anti-venom there. Done. And we're going to relics. And congratulations, you have now beat the Capsule Bay and Symphony of the Night 100%. <laughs> So, to close things out, who wants to see some really fun, cool uh, exploits that you do, particularly with like online stuff and direct cheating? Yeah. Awesome. So, here's the first one. This is funny. So, I guess we said a lot of hackers are gamers. There's a group that's called the Cult of the Dead Cow. Uh, I, I'm associated with them. They're really awesome guys. They love High Death Veggie. It's a hacker name. Uh, okay, this will be good. Um, and have you ever played? Who's played Team Fortress 2? Like all of them, yeah. Uh, so when you're in the game, probably one time there was a guy who was just shooting at you, and you were like, oh man, that must be a hacker, he must be using an aimbot, like a, a program that aims all the time. Turns out, probably something much simpler than that. Um, in Source Engine games, all the sound files are all saved, like no encrypted, right like once you install it. They were, I think they changed it. Yeah, they changed it later, but that was the last Source game, so you can load up uh, the Team Fortress 2. So the, the spy has to cloak and decloak in order to, like, decloak in order to hit you, so there's a sound effect for it, listen. You couldn't hear it. Like, even with bullets and stuff, you'd never be able to hear that. Now, let's replace the sound file called the same name and see if we could find that uh, spy again. <laughs> so sometimes it's just that simple. Um, if you want to do something on your mobile game, load up game, uh, go back to Game Guardian. Uh, with mobile games, there's actually an entire program that's called Game Guardian, and what you do is you put it in the same virtual space and load the game, and you can just change the value. So you might give yourself like a billion dollars in game currency. Well, guess what? You can do that. That's one of those things. And crazy enough, real quick, Game Guardian was created not to be like piracy, crazy hack stuff. There's a bunch of gamers that love mobile games, like Call of Duty Mobile and stuff, who are really mad about the microtransactions. They just want to play the game. So they literally created well, that. Like the, uh the energy yeah, stuff. Yeah. Just to play it. Sorry for going a little bit fast, but we're, we're going out of time. There will be uh, uh, the wrath of the thing. Can we show off one last thing, actually? Because we had a ton of stuff, but we'll get into this. So, uh, who played Red Dead Redemption? And don't, don't look quite late. So, we were going to do a thing on Fallout 76. That was kind of the joke. We unfortunately are running a long time. If we have a little bit more time, if they're generous, we will show that in a bit. But there's a problem that we have in modern games where no one updates their tools and engines. So, Red Dead Redemption 2, great game. The online, once you pass the encryption, it turns out the online engine is the exact same as uh, Grand Theft Auto Online, which has a lot of cheats in it. So it was broken. Yeah. So uh, they so when they realize that, it's like, oh, what we'll do is we'll spawn a bunch of bears, um, throw a stick of dynamite, harvest their pelts, and sell them the money. But the values were off, so instead we got bears, <laughs> the bear apocalypse. Endless bears, just bears as far as the eye can see. Bears and endless cougars and let's see if it shows up. Uh, yeah, endless cougars and naked women with bonnets wielding shotguns were immune to damage. And two-headed skeleton monsters, which were not used in the original game, for six hours. Across the entire online world, it was amazing. So yeah, the entire game was pretty much. Broken by that point. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, I don't know if we're on the time thing. Uh, yeah. We're, okay. We're so sorry, uh, sorry about that. We still want to do uh, the. Uh, we still want to do the. Uh, uh, cute. We can ask your questions outside, and uh, uh, we're getting ah, all you guys got raffle tickets. We will also do it outside. We have a bunch of RFID wallets, which will shield stuff from there, as well as pins and stuff. And I think that's it, yeah, so you can check us at defunto1.org and follow us on Twitter and Mastodon and...